Let's see. We good? There we go. I've got uh, three boys. You heard their names earlier. They love baseball. And so I think I'd probably seen this photo before. Let's throw this up on the screen. But I saw it again recently, and it got to me in a way it didn't get to me before. I think it's because of those three boys. This picture is called Yankee Boys. It was taken August 17th, 1948. See those four boys there? They got their gloves in their hand, the bats over their shoulders, right outside Yankee Stadium. It was a 70-degree day, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Joe DiMaggio went one for three, had two walks. Yogi Berra went three for five, had two RBIs. The Yankees won eight to one against the Washington Senators. The funniest thing to me, maybe my favorite thing about this picture, is it's a Tuesday, and those boys aren't at school. (laughs) Right? They know this is a day for baseball. That's why they're there. It was the day after Babe Ruth's death. Maybe the greatest player to ever play, certainly the greatest Yankee to ever play. And if there is a place to be in the baseball universe on this day, it's Yankee Stadium, and those boys are there. Almost there. Right, they are so close, they could probably hear the announcer inside. They could probably hear the fans erupting as Yogi Berra hits in those runs. They could probably smell the hot dogs, right? but they're not actually there, right? They are close, but they're not there. And the longer I look at this picture, I wonder how it ended. Now, how long did those boys wait outside wondering if they were going to go in? You know, hoping that maybe some security guard would look at them and have pity on them, or maybe some sweet lady at the ticket counter would say, okay, boys, around the seventh inning, why don't y'all just come on in? Or maybe not. You know, maybe they got tired of waiting. They went to this game with all kind of just excitement and enthusiasm. They've got their bats, right? They've got their gloves. They hope they're going to play on the field somehow, right? Maybe Yogi Berra will get injured and somebody will call them in. (laughs) They think that, right? They go to this game just full of hope and excitement that they are going to make it in. And I wonder if they made it. Or did they get tired? You know, did they start thinking about what mom was cooking for dinner? and just take off. And you think about it, there's four of them there. If one of them left, how much harder for the other three to stay? And if two left, how in the world are those other two going to stay? If three left, just one, can you imagine the one waiting for his chance to get inside? You think they made it? You know, it's a question of the heart, isn't it? You know, at the heart, at the threshold. Does the heart there at the threshold Hold on. I think about this picture now every time I enter the passage that I've been given, Hebrews 3, 7 to 4, 13. Every time I go into that passage now, I think about this picture because I think the author of Hebrews would say today's a day kind of like that. And I don't know if he would have liked baseball or if he would have got the analogy. And frankly, I don't get all of his analogies. I'm still trying to figure out Melchizedek. But for him, we are almost there, but not quite. Now, we are almost into the game. We can smell the hot dogs. We can hear the announcers, hear the fans applauding, but we're almost there and not actually in. We're almost to that heavenly country, he says in chapter 11. He says, if you will just wait a little while, in Hebrews 10, for him we are almost there. And today, maybe the key word in my passage, today is a day like that. It's a not yet, but almost kind of day. Not yet. I don't preach a lot of not yet. I don't know about you, but I prefer the already to the not yet. Amen? Maybe you've heard those terms before if you've been around church for a while. There's the already, what we have right now in Christ Jesus, and there's the not yet, what we're just waiting on, which we're so close to. And I don't know about you, but I prefer the already to the not yet. Certainly when I'm thinking about what I'm going to preach. And the truth is, the already is all over Hebrews. In fact, the already, what we already have in Christ Jesus, brackets my passage. It's there in Hebrews 3, 1 to 6. We are God's house right now. We're God's house. And if you go to the end of my passage, 4, 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace to receive all the help we need in our time of trouble. You can get that win right now. 
You can have it right now. But those aren't the passages Mike gave me. <laughs> he bracketed me in, 3.7 to 4.13. He said, Eric, this is your first time. Don't blow it. <laughs> Stay in your lane. So, I mean, I don't preach a lot and not yet. I don't know about you. Don't hear it a lot. My boys, uh, my wife and I, all of our families in Dallas, we live in Memphis, Tennessee, so it's about a seven to eight hour drive to grandparents' house. And every time we make that drive to grandparents' house, from the first hour, the kids are asking me, what? Are we there yet? Right? There is no place in the world they want to be more than their grandparents' house. You want to know the truth? There is no place in the world I'd rather be because the moment we get there, I get free babysitting. And I'm convinced that's what heaven's like. <laughs> free babysitting, amen? Listen, when they ask me, are we there yet? I don't want to say not yet any more than they want to hear it. Hebrews 3, 7 to 4, 13 is a not yet passage. You're not there inside the stadium yet. You are not at grandma's, but you are so close. And as hard as it is to hear that, sometimes we need to. Sometimes we do. Dive here with me into this passage. Let me show you what's going on in this text. And you get a big, you, you'll get the feel of it if we just look at the first half, but I'll take you to all of it here in a moment. But Hebrews 3 to 4 is a sermon from a song. Okay, the song is Psalm 95, one of the most amazing psalms out there. In fact, some of our camp songs that you've sung growing up like I have come from Psalm 95. So come let us sing with joy to the Lord. Let us shout out, woo, yeah, to the rock of our salvation. That's not my text, but it's in Psalm 95. <laughs> come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Father. Right now, again, also Psalm 95, not my part. <laughs> Hebrews 3, he says, come with me to the end of the psalm. And he says, what you find in the Psalm 95 is the Lord our God through the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and me right now today. And this is what he says. Look at this, verse 7. <clears throat> so as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me. Though for 40 years they saw what I did. <clears throat> that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That's the song. That's the song he preaches this sermon from. And that song, best I can tell, is from a moment in time in Israel's history. It comes from Numbers 14. You're going to be familiar with this part. It's, it's a threshold moment. God has brought them out of slavery, and they stand on the line, on the very threshold of the promised land, which for them is a land flowing with milk and honey, which means what? For former slaves, it means rest. Rest. That's what this means, right? So these are people coming out of slavery into the land that God has promised them, which is a land that he has promised will be a place of rest for them. They're on the threshold, and in that moment, you'll remember this, the spies go out and they check out the land, and they come back, and they say, oh, turns out uh, we're not going to take that land. No chance we're going there. And then they start grumbling. They start complaining. Who do they blame? They blame Moses, right? They start having meetings about the minister without the minister there. <laughs> you know about those meetings? <clears throat> Form a search committee, and the minister's still there. <laughs> they say, why would you bring us out here, Moses? This is your fault, isn't it? We need to choose somebody else to pastor this church, Moses. You know what? We're out of here. Let's head back to Egypt. It was better back there, they say. So then Joshua and Caleb, the associate ministers, are there, and they're tearing their clothes, and they're shouting. Listen to what they say. The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. It's exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only listen to this. Do not rebel against the Lord. 
And don't be afraid of the people of the land because we'll devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Look at this. Don't rebel or sin because you are afraid. Don't disobey because you distrust. Meanwhile, Moses is back in the office. He's on the phone with God. Listen to what God is saying to him. How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe, to doubt me, in spite of all the things I have performed among them? I know that says Hebrews. It's actually numbers. I was in a Hebrew state of mind when I made these slides. <laughs> God's talking to Moses. God's saying, how long am I going to put up with this? And Moses says, God, it is not going to look good if you bail on your people. A lot of people are paying attention. Can I just remind you, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. And it sounds like, I'll be honest, this scene sounds like most shepherds and ministers I know, blamed for what's wrong, pleading with the people blaming them to stay, and all the while begging God not to stop helping them. Right. Man, reminds me of COVID-19. Being a threshold pastor to threshold people is hard work. And that's the work, isn't it? That's it. And the author of Hebrews, he has this class for ministers, for shepherds, for those who care about the people of God. He says, hey, this is the work. Look at this. I'll give you the beginning of Hebrews 3, starting at verse 12, and we'll go to 4, 11. I want you to see that the beginning and end of this passage, the encouragement that he gives us. He says, this is what ministry looks like. Look at this. See to it. See to it. Brothers and sisters. That none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart, pay attention to that, that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened in your heart by sin's deceitfulness. And we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Go with me to 411 in the end of this passage. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Doesn't that sound hard? See to it. See to it. Encourage one another daily. Make sure. Hold fast till the very end. Make every effort to enter that rest. That sounds like hard work, pastoring people at the threshold who are almost there but not there yet. That sounds like hard work to me. Why is that work so hard? I think it's because of the human heart. The human heart. The Puritan preacher John Flavel said, Heart work is hard work. <laughs> he knows something, doesn't he? Yeah. He knows something. A buddy of mine at church uh, had his car stolen the other day. He comes down out of his apartment, his car is just gone, okay? Memphis police show up and they tell him, hey, you're, you're never going to see that car again. You need to make other plans. Uh, but a couple weeks later, he gets a call from the police department and his car's shown up. And a window's been busted out of the car. It's totally trashed inside. It's filled with all kinds of trash. But sitting on the passenger seat, on the top of the passenger seat, is a pamphlet, okay? Like the kind of pamphlet that you would pull up to a, a red light and somebody would knock on the window and hand into the car, okay? And the pamphlet says this in big, bold letters, Is your heart right with God? <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. Somehow, these guys were driving around Memphis in a stolen car, drive up to a stoplight. Somebody knocks on the window and hands them in that pamphlet that says, is your heart right with God? And this is what I can't get over. They don't throw it out the window. Right? Like, if you're stealing cars, you don't care about littering. Unless you're in California. And then you probably do care about it. You're probably into sustainable Grand Theft Auto here in California. Amen. Right, but it's a penetrating question, isn't it? Is your heart right with God? Is your heart right? It's one of the key words in this passage in Hebrews 3 and 4, the heart, right? It, it, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your 
hearts as they did in the days of the rebellion. Biblically, biblically the heart is what led those boys to the stadium that day, and it's what might have led them home before they ever got in. It's the source of all your desires, everything you want, your will, okay? Sometimes it's called your wanter. And what Jesus says when he's asked what the most important thing is, what does he say? It's to love the Lord your God with what? All of your heart. Like above all else, what God wants is your heart. Like what, what God wants more than anything else is for you to want him more than anything else. That's what it is. That's what God wants. And we live in a moment, I think, where people are realizing the things that they have attempted to satisfy their hearts with do not satisfy. I know with a young man recently came to me. This guy doesn't even know who Matthew is, okay? Doesn't know that Mark comes after Matthew, but he came to our church, and this is what he told me. He said, I was in tech startups, and I made a lot of money, and all the money I made I spent and I lost. He said, I tried to drink away how that made me feel, and all that made, made me was more sad. So I found a woman, a beautiful woman, and I married her, and I thought that would make me happy. And he said, the marriage is on the rocks. My life is still falling apart. Is there something, he said, that will satisfy what nothing else will? You'll know this. Augustine famously said that our hearts are restless, unsatisfied. Right? And Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. To finish Augustine's quote, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. <clears throat> but this is where you really get that already and not yet tension. Because there is the rest, the satisfaction, the joy, the peace, the people of the kingdom, people of Jesus Christ experience right now, and yet somehow... That is only a taste of the rest that's going to come. It's, as I try to visualize this, it's something like a mountain stream, that if you were on a hike up a mountain, you were to come to this mountain stream, and you were to dip your hand down into it and drink from that cool water, it would satisfy you, right? It would give you the energy to keep going, but that rest, that satisfaction is just confirmation for you that somewhere up the mountain is this mountain lake that's filled with trout that you can dive in if you want to freeze to death, Right? <laughs> that'll satisfy you and fill you in ways that stream never could, right? And the rest that we receive in this life from Jesus Christ is something like that. That's just satisfying for a moment to point us to the rest that we are not there yet to. And so what can happen after you take that sip, if you take that drink of water, is that the heart, once satisfied, can become unsatisfied. It can start to look elsewhere for that satisfaction again. And the heart once satisfied by Jesus' rest will go looking for rest somewhere else. Our church, Highland in Memphis, uh, one of our big things is ministry to those with special needs. And uh, it's, it is such a blessing. It's more of a blessing to us than it is to those friends of ours who come and are part of it. And one of the things we do is we host an event called Quest. And to get a visual of it, it's something like a, a VBS for those with special needs. We'll have 200 folks with special needs at our church. We'll partner them all up with buddies, and it is so fun. And on the fill intake form, the, their caretakers will tell us if there's something that we need to know about this person that we're caring for that night. And this, this young man, what was written on his was a term. It turns out it's a technical term, but I love it. The term is prone to elope prone to elope, which doesn't mean he's a hopeless romantic. I thought you just can't help but get married. I thought maybe that was it. No, prone to elope means he's a runner. He's a runner. And so we partnered him with these two senior boys. They're uh, football players, athletes. And so they would, they would follow him into each room and they would sit on either side of him. We'd be in the big assembly singing songs, silly songs. And he would look at those two boys and he would start to smile. And then he would just bolt over the chairs behind him and start running out. And you'd hear just ripple through the audience, we got a runner, we got a runner. And people were just scrambling to get this guy. And those seniors were chasing him down. By the end of the week, they were so exhausted. <laughs> but they learned that he had this tell, okay? And they didn't realize it at first, but every time he was about to run, he would slip his shoes off. 
think, for better grip in his bare feet on the floor. So they started paying attention to his shoes. When his shoes were off, he was ready to run. And I have thought about that so many times since then, how that is such an image of the human heart. You know, shoes off, ready to run, not because we are on holy ground, but because we're ready to run. The human heart is like that. And let me tell you, pastors, shepherds, ministers, those who love and care about the church, it is exhausting to chase the human heart. It is exhausting. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Now that's a not yet sign. Now here's what the author of Hebrews would say, I think. I think he'd say to be people ministering to those on the threshold of real rest, but not there yet, is a risky spot to be. Because on the threshold of real rest, some will not make it in, is what he says. And listen, this troubles us as people of grace. I mean, this flies all over me. I don't like it. This is what he says. Some can be right there on the threshold and not actually make it into the game. The Calvinists would say it's because they were never really saved. The Armenian would say it's because you never lose your free will. Even up until the last moment, you can choose to reject the grace of Jesus Christ. Hebrews doesn't split those hairs, which is so funny that he doesn't wade into the arguments we have. Right? He just knows you can be so close and somehow walk away. And people do. Led elsewhere by their heart. That's what happened back in Numbers 14, he says, to those bodies who fell in the desert. They were so close, but they did not make it in. He would say, listen, you can't earn this thing Jesus did. Jesus did it once and for all. You can't earn what he has done for you, but you can sure lose it. He would say, why? Why? How? Why does the heart grow restless? What I call it is the disobedience of disbelief. Look with me at this. He says the problem is this in Hebrews 3.12, the sinful, unbelieving heart. Which is it, sin or doubt? Sin or unbelief, which is it? Ten times, he says, they were entering that rest, but they didn't make it in. Why? Well, look at this in Hebrews 3.19. So we see they were not able to enter because of what? Their unbelief. Okay. Or is it this, Hebrews 4.6, they were not able to go in because of their disobedience. <laughs> which is it? Yes. Right? Disobedience or disbelief? Yes. Right? Hebrews keeps telling us. So this is what a Hebrews is all about. Jesus is the greater prophet. He's the greater priest. He's the greater Moses. He is the greater sacrifice. He is the patron who will not fail to take care of his people. He has promised you a greater rest than you can ever imagine. And what he says is some will doubt that. Some will doubt that he is really greater and the reward he offers to those who persevere is really worth it. And they will go looking elsewhere for that rest. Since the garden, since the garden, every sin at some level is doubt that what the Lord offers us is really greater. C.S. Lewis those from my church tuning in will know I love C.S. Lewis, and it wouldn't be a good sermon without him. He says this from the weight of glory. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. 
he says, don't be. Don't believe the lie that he is not enough. What he offers is greater. And if you will hold on, if you will persevere the rest that he wants to give to you, weary pastor, the rest that he wants to give to you, weary shepherd, is more and greater than you can ever imagine. Do, do not believe there is something better out there. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God and for anyone who enters God's rest. Whoo, that's a hard job. Oh, it's a hard job. Maybe you feel like you don't have what you need for that job. Ever feel that way? Man, I know I have. We went to Hot Springs, Arkansas for a vacation last fall break. Worst vacation we ever took. <laughs> I can't tell you all the things that went wrong on that trip. We were in the pediatric ER within two hours of getting there. <laughs> Bit on a piece of glass in my fajitas that night. That's gross. So we were trying to turn this trip around, and so we decided to do the kind of thing that you can only do in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and that is pay a lot of money to go dig in the dirt for crystals. <laughs> Crystal mining. Anybody ever done this? Hot Springs, Arkansas, I don't recommend it. <laughs> we drive into this place, and it's a, it's a real-life crystal mine, okay? It's, it's the real thing. And so they've got, like, heavy machine, machinery going in the background, and you pull up, and outside of the shop where you go in to buy your tickets, there is a crystal the size of my minivan, Okay, and that's the crystal my boys see. <laughs> that's what they think they're going to find. <laughs> right? And we go into the warehouse, and it is full, as far as the eye can see, with crystals bigger than my head. Okay, these huge crystals they probably bought in China. <laughs> okay, and I go out there, and I pay way too much money to go dig in piles of dirt behind the warehouse. And I show up and I tell the guys, like, listen, we don't have anything to, to like dig for these crystals. Do you have what I need? And this is what he said. These were his words. I can sell you everything you need. <laughs> you know what he had? He had this little three-pronged garden hoe. That was it. For $10, I got three boys, okay? Spent $30 to get three, three-pronged garden hose that fit in your hand. We go out there, it's about 90 degrees. The sun is beating down on us. There's no shade. We're in a pile of dirt, chipping away at rocks with a three-pronged garden hoe. We don't find anything bigger than the size of a Tic Tac, okay? My boys, the whole time, why do you hate us so much, Dad? Why did you bring us out here to die? And they say, <clears throat> They're miserable the whole time. And then, get this, lumbering up the road by this pile of dirt comes this big excavator. A guy driving it works there. And in the, the, the scoop of the excavator, I can see crystals just spilling out of the excavator. And he drives by and he looks at me on the top of this pile of dirt. And he tips his hat to me as if to say, you and me, brother, we're doing the same thing. <laughs> no, we're not. Being a threshold pastor, I think, could feel a lot like that. I need heavier equipment to mine these hearts. Well, like, I don't have what it takes to get to these hearts, right? And so this passage, let me just be really honest, is a hard passage. And maybe you're wondering, where is the grace in this passage? It comes right here in Hebrews 4.12. Look at this with me. Look at this. For the Word of God is alive and active. And it is sharper than any double-edged sword. And it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of what? The heart. The heart. Look, you see that? You actually have exactly what you need to get to the heart. You know, you have the one thing in this world that has the ability to penetrate the heart, to lay it open, to cut it open bare, and for God's word to just penetrate deep in there in people's lives to be actually changed. I remember I was with a group of preachers one time. We got to hear Kent Brantley, the doctor who survived Ebola. That is an incredible man of God. I was so moved by being with him. And I remember all 12 of us ministers who had sat there listening to him. We come back into our room, he leaves, and we look at each other. And to a man, we said, I should have been a doctor. Because <laughs> then I could have helped people. Right? 
then I could have helped people. Look at this. Jesus says, if you deal in the word of God, you are operating heavy machinery. <laughs> right? Like you have actually everything you need to get to the human heart because you have what? His word. And I know the word is living and active. It is more than just the Bible. But make no mistake, when the author of Hebrews wants to drive something home to the heart, he preaches a Bible sermon. He's like, y'all, let's open up to Psalm 95 and let me tell you how this is talking about you today. Right? The word of God gets to the heart. The other day, Lindsay and I, my wife, we got a text message from a friend who is dear to us. And she had the kind of loss that, that never gets better. Never gets better. She was having a hard day, and she reached out. And I looked at Lindsay, and I said, I don't know what to say. And so I texted her. Our our church, Highland, has five memory verses for memorizing this year. One of them is Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's all I said. And then I get the dot, dot, dot. It stops, dot, dot, dot. It stops. And then the next thing that comes in is a picture, and it's a picture of a flower vase on her desk. She's a school teacher. And on the flower vase, it says Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And she said, my students brought me this today. 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 She said, apparently God knows what I needed to hear. You have what you need. You have what you need. But it's not only that. It's not only that you have what you need, it's that you're not alone. Three times the author has this haunting refrain from Psalm 95. Listen, today, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Reminds me of that early 2000s book, devotional book, Jesus is Calling. Remember that book, Jesus is Calling. And this passage is this really strong challenge to those who would be in the care of the human heart and the soul of those we love. It's like, hey, you've got what you need. Get out there and encourage them constantly, daily. Make every effort to pursue and mine the human heart for the sake of God. But listen, all the DIY projects in my house will prove sometimes even when you have the right tool, you can't do the right job. Right? And it would be so much better if somebody who actually knew what they were doing would show up. And what the author of Hebrews says is he is there every time. And that he is calling to every single heart that you are. And he's ahead of you speaking to their heart. So just meet him there. Not long ago, I, I got one of those calls uh, you don't want to get. It's from a woman at our church, and uh, she was crying so much, I could barely understand what she was saying. But I knew the marriage was in trouble. That's what I got. And so immediately I'm in conversation with the husband, and he's done things he's terribly ashamed of. He's broken, and we're in deep conversation. And I'll be so honest with you, I remember him in my office telling me the story, and I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I'm just praying through it. I'm bumbling the whole thing. You know what this is like, minister? Like you're trying to hold together these people who are falling apart. You know, trying to keep them there at the threshold and not let them fall away. And you feel like you have no idea what you're doing. You're just bumbling your way through it. You're just trying to be faithful to the Lord. You're just trying to plant the word of God into his life. And you have no idea if it's taking root or if you're doing anything good. And so I beg him, hey, why don't you come to church Sunday? He doesn't come. He doesn't come. He's too ashamed. But the next Sunday, I look out from the pulpit and I see him. And like preachers, you know, some of you have done this before. You see him from the pulpit and you want to stop. (laughs) And you don't. You make a middle note. I'm going to go talk to him after. So the sermon ends. I come down and immediately there's kind of a crowd of people and somebody grabs me and I'm trying to make my way over. By the time I get to him, he's gone. His wife's there. She's crying. Put my arm around her shoulder. I say, where is he? She says, I don't know. And so I'm kicking myself. I think that he's left church. I didn't get to hug him and tell him how proud I am that he's there. So I go back to the other side of the worship room, and I'm talking to people, and I'm probably about 15 minutes, and my five-year-old son, Deacon, who's asleep here on the front row, he loves to listen to his daddy. (laughs) 
And he comes to me there in the back of the worship room and he grabs my leg. And he's usually with his mom on Sunday morning, but he's lost his mama. He had run off from her and he needs to get to Sunday school class. He says, Daddy, will you take me to class? And so I walk out a door. I never go out into the children's wing, which I never go into that direction at this time on Sunday morning. I just never go that way this time on Sunday morning. And I walk out the door and you know who's standing there in an empty hallway? That husband. Nobody else around, just him. And right behind him, right at that moment, the children's ministry door opens, and it's my wife. And she says, Deacon, where have you been? And she takes Deacon, and it's just me and him standing in this empty hallway. And I wrap my arms around him. I can't tell you how significant that moment was for me, this pastor who feels like he never knows what he's doing for God to say, Eric, I'm ahead of you. I'm just waiting for you to join me here. I asked him, I said, hey, what are you doing here? And he said, you know, I don't know. I just felt like I was supposed to come back in. Jesus is calling. I was on an airplane flying out here a few months ago to meet with the other speakers who were um, preparing for this. And there was this 18-month-old girl in her daddy's arms in front of me, and I tell you what, she wanted to be everywhere in that airplane but in her daddy's arms. I mean, she was convinced that everywhere in that airplane was better than in her daddy's arms. And her daddy just wrestled her the whole flight. It's about three hours long, just wrestling her. And he kept drawing her back to his chest, and he would whisper into his ear, into her ear, baby, it's okay, just lay down. And she would fight it. She wanted to be everywhere else. And he would call her back, and he would say, baby, it's okay, just lay down. And finally, she just rested in his arms. And I thought, that's it. That's it. Chronicles of Narnia, the last battle, it ends with King Tyrion. He's the last king of Narnia. It's a time in Narnia when no one believes in Aslan anymore. No one believes in Aslan. They believe in just about anything else and everything else that people are saying, but nobody believes in Aslan except Tyrion and a few others, and he's fighting with all he has for this thing. Sometimes he's not even sure if he believes in because he's never seen Aslan. But he fights, and at the very end, it ends like this. As Tyrion spoke, the earth trembled suddenly and the sweet air grew suddenly sweeter and a brightness flashed behind them and all turned and Tyrion turned last because he was afraid but there stood his heart's desire huge and real the golden lion Aslan himself and Aslan fixed his eyes upon Tyrion, and Tyrion came near, trembling, and he flung himself at the lion's feet, and the lion kissed him, and he said, Well done, last of the kings of Narnia, who stood firm at the darkest hour. I guess I tell you that story to say, Pastor, minister, shepherd, those who care about the people of God, it is worth it to stand firm even for you. Because he will satisfy what nothing else can for you. He will give you rest. Let me pray over you and invite our team up to lead us in worship. God, would you satisfy what nothing else can? Would you give to us the rest we crave more than anything else in this world? Would you be enough, Lord? Help us to believe it. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.